Welcome everybody. I'm HR McMaster. It's great to it's great to see you. And I, I can't thank the Sign Institute enough and, and American University for the privilege of being with all of you. And, and thanks especially to all of you for attending. I can't believe it's the the last in, in our lecture series, but we're we're go, we're going out with with a real highlight. And it's it, it is a great privilege for me to welcome here today uh, Mr. Ilbert Bajraktari, who's going to to make some remarks after my opening remarks and. And then be available for your for your questions in the discussion that follows. Ilbert is a distinguished alumnus of, of this great institution, American University. He came to the United States at the age of 21 in 1999, in the wake of the destructive civil war in Kosovo. He attended American University, graduating in December of 2003, and then he attended the the Woodrow Wilson School of Princeton University, where he, where he obtained his his master's degree. Uh, he has he specialized to a certain extent in the, in the Middle East uh, since that time. Uh, after graduation from Princeton, he became a, a presidential management fellow, which, uh, which he may want to talk more about and I think we'll, we'll probably describe to you, but he went around from job to job around, uh, around our government and to decide maybe where he wanted to land. But he kind of got stuck with me in, in, Iraq in, uh, in 2007, rewriting the, the campaign plan. Uh, for the Iraq War, and of course, he just did a brilliant job there. It's when I first got to know him, and and uh, and then he was the director for Iran in the Department of Defense and the National Security Council uh, prior to the, the Iran nuclear deal for for six years. He's a graduate of the National War College, and 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 when he was at the National War College, Secretary Ash Carter grabbed him and said, "Hey, I need you in my front office as a deputy chief of staff." Uh, and then he and then quite unexpectedly, when I became National Security Advisor. I, I said, hey, Obera, can you come help me out over here? And he was the director for defense on the National Security Council staff, did a brilliant job, and then worked at the Office of Net Assessment, which is a forward-thinking organization within the Department of Defense. And now he works in the private sector in Goldman Sachs. So and we couldn't have a, really a better final guest than my that my dear friend, Obera Bajraktari. And you know, our, our previous sessions have focused on strategic competence right, and, and how we might improve our ability to overcome challenges to national and international security associated with revisionist powers, China and Russia, hostile states such as Iran and North Korea, uh, or jihadist terrorist organizations. And we emphasized the need in, in the previous lectures to overcome our tendency toward strategic narcissism or a self-referential view of the world. And we also highlighted the importance of, of viewing complex challenges and opportunities from the perspective of others, especially rivals, adversaries, and enemies. We discussed how this idea of strategic empathy is foundational to a competent foreign policy and national security strategy. But in this, our final session, I would like to introduce the theme of strategic confidence and how confidence in who we are as Americans, as well as confidence in our democratic principles, institutions, and processes is essential if we are to build a better future. So we might all resolve to improve not only our competence, but also the confidence necessary to implement a sustained approach to foreign policy and national security. 
I think we'd all agree, agree that we, we have some work to do. Of course, George Floyd's murder and, and the protests and violence it sparked in the midst of a pandemic, as well as the January 6th assault on our capital, stoked by conspiracy theories and baseless claims of widespread election fraud, laid bare deep divisions in our society. Even worse than vitriolic partisanship, a lack of empathy for one another is catalyzing a destructive interaction between identity politics, critical race theory, bigotry, and racism. I believe that interaction combined with vitriolic political partisanship is generating centripetal forces that are spinning us apart from one another and sapping confidence in our common identity as Americans. Lack of empathy here at home, like strategic narcissism abroad, is rooted in ignorance. Those who know least about issues and who are strangers to their fellow Americans seek affirmation of their biases rather than knowledge. They judge their neighbors rather than try to understand their perspective. History can help us regain confidence and relearn how to empathize with one another. We might reinforce the worn fabric of our society by considering how our past produced our present. Divisions in our society and, and civil unrest associated with them are not new. A broad historical perspective leads us to the conclusion that we are still coping with the legacy of slavery. As bias and vitriol contaminates the information environment today, the manipulation of history remains an important tool for those who want to sow division and conflict rather than foster unity and goodwill. Ignorance of history, compounded by the abuse of history, undermines our ability to work together and improve our nation and our society because it saps our national pride. As the late philosopher Richard Rorty observed, national pride is to countries what self-respect is to individuals, a necessary condition for self-improvement. Pride in our nation should not derive from a contrived, happy view of history, but rather from a recognition that the American experiment in freedom and democracy always was and remains a work in progress. For example, the emancipation of 4 million of our fellow Americans after the most destructive war in our history was only the beginning of a long journey for equal rights. Milestones along that journey included the failure of reconstruction after the Civil War, Jim Crow segregation and the rise of the Ku Klux Klan, and separate but equal. In the 1960s, the civil rights movement dismantled the legal basis for Jim Crow segregation, but cultural, economic, educational, and other forms of disenfranchisement continued. The manipulation of history was foundational to the obstruction of equal rights for Black Americans, as, as the myth of the lost cause portrayed slavery as a benign instead of cruel institution, and the Civil War as a noble effort to preserve states' rights rather than slavery. But it is also the abuse of history to cast the American Revolution as an effort to preserve slavery rather than a righteous struggle to found a nation on principles that ultimately rendered that horrible institution unsustainable. It is possible to celebrate the principles enshrined in our Declaration of Independence and Bill of Rights and also recognize that much of our history has cut against those principles and that work remains to realize them. We are fortunate that we can make progress because our republic was founded on the radical idea that sovereignty lies neither with king or parliament, but with the people. We might ask one another the following questions to spark nonpartisan discussions of what we can do together to strengthen our nation. How to rebuild trust in American institutions. How to rekindle hope among rural and urban communities that have lost sight of the American dream. 
by improving education, abolishing the soft bigotry of low expectations, strengthening families, and fostering new economic opportunities. How to urge our representatives in government to set an example for bipartisanship and address fundamental causes of polarization in America. How to inspire more Americans to serve in organizations that bring people together from all racial, ethnic, religious, and economic backgrounds, such that, as happens routinely in our military, prejudice gives way to common understanding, mutual trust, and pride in serving the nation and one another. How to improve civics education to instill pride in the vision of our founders and the uniqueness of our democracy while recognizing as our founders did, that the American experiment requires constant nurturing and improvement. And of course, what has been the principal subject of this series, how to develop a reasoned and sustainable foreign policy and defense strategy to secure freedom, achieve peace, and promote prosperity for generations to come. As we discuss all of the above, let us resolve to give at least equal time to what we agree upon before we clarify areas of disagreement. We need to begin the recovery process now because our traumas have caused discontent, divisiveness, and anxiety at home. While abroad, the global pandemic has catalyzed challenges that threaten to make the world less free, less prosperous, and less safe. Read Chinese Communist Party Politburo member Yang Jinshu's statement at the Alaska meeting if you doubt that America's rivals are emboldened by a perceived weakness and lack of, nat of national pride. I know from leading soldiers in combat that overcoming traumatic experiences takes time and collective sustained effort, but I think we should be optimistic. While we should be concerned about the polarization of our, our society, we should remain confident in our principles and who we are as a people. Unlike Zhang Jianxue, we live in a nation in which we have a say in how we are governed and can, through elections, administer a corrective short of revolution. We live under rule of law and enjoy freedom of speech freedom of the press and of assembly. A sense of our history can help us recognize demagoguery, reject false dilemmas, and work together today to build a better future. It is possible to improve equality of opportunity, and in particular, access to high quality education, so that the zip code into which one is born does not impede access to the great promise of America. It is possible to protect our privacy from the avarice of social media companies and counter cyber-enabled information warfare while preserving freedom of speech. It is possible to ensure voting rights while constantly improving the security and transparency of our electoral processes. It is possible to overcome racism, sexism, and other forms of bigotry without surrendering our individual agency or succumbing to reified philosophies that promote victimhood as the new heroism and teach our children that they are defined more by their identity category than their character. We need not wait for the political class to restore our confidence. We can all make a difference, reach out to our fellow Americans, engage in respectful debate, and arrest the destructive interaction between identity politics, critical race theory, bigotry, and racism. We can empathize with one another and strengthen our commitment to one another and the principles we hold dear. As the civil rights activist and patriot Rosa Parks observed, to bring about change, we must not be afraid to take the first step. We will fail when we fail to try. It is time for all of us to take that step. You can all make a difference every day. 
reach out to your fellow Americans, engage in respectful discussions, reject demagoguery rooted in ignorance, bigotry, and racism, and strengthen our democracy. It is my pleasure to introduce my friend and former colleague, Ilber Bajraktaria. I can't think of a, a better way to introduce him than to read a paragraph from my book. I'm not plugging my book here, but I want you to know that I had Ilber in mind when I wrote this paragraph. Immigrants have been and remain one of America's greatest competitive advantages. Oppressed peoples who come to the United States, a self-selecting group, have the intrepidity to start a new life and are appreciative of the freedom and opportunity in America. A way to overcome fractures in our society would be to talk less about who we do not want to come to America and more about whom America needs. Those who believe in our constitution, the rule of law, and the opportunity to work hard to create a better life should be welcomed into our liberal democratic culture. Ilber Bajraktaria is a, is a tremendous American, a tremendous patriot, and, and I, I can't thank you enough for joining us, Ilber, and a pleasure to, to introduce you to the, uh, to, to the students here at, at American University, your, old, your alma mater. Great. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, John McMaster. It's, uh, thank you for the uh, kind introduction. It's a privilege to be with you uh, today. Uh, and as you noted, uh, uh, it was a great privilege uh, uh, to have the opportunity to serve with you in uh, three different capacities uh, in Iraq in 2007, in Afghanistan in 2010, and then most recently uh, at the White House from 2017 to 2018. Uh, and uh, much of what I have learned uh, professionally has really come through the experiences, uh, through those experiences. And nearly everything that I have learned about uh, leadership, uh, competence, uh, strategic things thinking, and most critically, the, the importance of perseverance has been through those experiences that, that I've had the privilege of uh, sharing with you and uh, by observing you. And now I should say that another important uh, thing that I've learned uh, from General McMaster is uh, through all the trials and through all the toughness of uh, professional settings, uh, such as the war in Iraq or the political uh, dynamics uh, of the White House, it is very important not to lose one sense of uh, uh, humanitarianism and who you are as a human being. Uh, so I have countless examples of uh, General McMaster always finding time out of his busy schedule to mentor uh, the, uh, that next uh, junior officer, uh, to open a door for someone who was just starting uh, their career in public service, uh, or even to, uh, uh, to resettle a, a great Iraqi family here in the US uh, and make sure that they felt uh, being at, at home here. Uh, now, as John McMaster said, it's, it's also a great pleasure for me to be back at American University. American has a special uh, uh, place in my heart as a general mentioned, I went to American from 2000 to 2003 and got my bachelor's from the School of International Service. I have to say that I'm a little jealous because when I attended American, and this tells you how old I am, it was still the old SIS building. The new SIS had not even started. So occasionally when I have a chance to come back physically on campus, I like to go and visit the new SIS school. Uh, but in addition to, I would say, the world-class education uh, that I was able to get at American, uh, meet some of the best people I've met uh, in my entire life and make some of the best memories, Americans hold another uh, uh, special place uh, for me. Uh, I started in American, as I mentioned, uh, merely a few months after I had arrived uh, in, uh, in the United States as a refugee in uh, 1999. Uh, so 1999 was, uh, 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 to, to be direct, a pretty dramatic year for my family and I, uh, and for nearly uh, every person in the Kosovo where I'm from uh, originally. Uh, decades old uh, political tensions uh, had come to a head in 1999 and the, the war that uh, Serbia had started in Kosovo in, in 1997 uh, really began to escalate uh, fairly dramatically in, in the early months of uh, 1997 with uh, massacres becoming more frequent, massive displacement of the population, extrajudicial killings, 
uh, and all sort of other uh, atrocities. So then by March of, uh, of that year, uh, so March of 99, the US and uh, its European allies uh, decided that uh, enough was enough, uh, that uh, they were gonna intervene uh, to put an end to this uh, uh, war in, in Kosovo. Now the, that intervention, which was done primarily from the air, uh, took some time, uh, 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 about three months uh, to conclude. And during that time, Serbia continued to sort of push uh, people out of uh, Kosovo displaced them. About 70% of the population got uh, uh, displaced, making one of the biggest uh, humanitarian catastrophes uh, in Europe since World War II. Uh, so in short, it was a very uh, sort of a tough situation. But, uh, but thankfully, the US uh, persevered and uh, prevailed. Uh, it successfully brought the war to, uh, to an end. Uh, it deployed a peacekeeping force to stabilize the situation, enable the reconstruction uh, and rebuilding. And then it put the path on a, a, a towards independence with Kosovo becoming uh, independent in 2008. Um, uh, so uh, 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 so tremendous progress, if you will, uh, from uh, 1999. Uh, it, it, so, in effect, the U.S. and the Europeans managed to save nearly two million Kosovars from what was a, a, a assured ethnic cleansing and calamity. Now, for me, you know, at that point, uh, I, I felt that I had seen enough, uh, and uh, so I decided to uh, resettle here in the U.S. Uh, as a refugee. Uh, so, I ended up in in D.C. Uh, and. So going through that experience and then landing on campus at American University uh, in 2000, uh, the contrast could have not been uh, bigger, uh, but I will always be grateful to American uh, for uh, giving me home, uh, away from home, for providing me with some of the best, best friends that I have to this day, and then uh, also for providing me an environment in which I could learn academically and theoretically about what had just transpired in practice uh, in uh, Kosovo. But more importantly, I would say it sort of provided me an environment in which I could rediscover uh, humanity and humanism. Uh, so I really uh, treasure uh, that experience uh, from American University uh, and those early months. And then I would say uh, related to our theme today, perhaps most importantly, American University provided me with an intellectual environment in, in which uh, I, uh, uh, both I could uh, sort of uh, uh, find some answers that, uh, uh, that I was in need of uh, having just uh, gone through the experience of 99, but also get the necessary academic training that I wanted to get to prepare me for a career in, in public service. Uh, as Joe mentioned, I spent about 13 years uh, between the Pentagon uh, and the White House having left uh, in September 2019. Now, uh, one thing that struck me uh, when I first started uh, at American was a sort of a more critical approach that I would encounter among the students and the professors towards US foreign and domestic policy. Uh, so uh, uh, this will become apparent, particularly in the, uh, during the class uh, the discussions that we would have uh, on a variety of uh, uh, subjects. So now I've, I have to admit, yeah, at that time, and in those early days of, of arrival in the US, that struck me as somewhat strange, but and occasionally frustrating, but I came to appreciate that over time, because my perspective was having just been the beneficiary of American foreign policy intervention in Kosovo, it was really hard to wrap my mind around this approach of sort of more self-criticism, retrospection, and occasional self-doubt. Uh, because, you know, I had just witnessed in Kosovo the bravery of American diplomats, American pilots, American soldiers. Uh, I had just witnessed enormous sacri diplomatic sacrifice and investment the US had made to rally the world uh, around the intervention in Kosovo. Uh, you has had uh, defied Russia, which was on, on the side of Serbia as being their more sort of traditional and staunch ally. And at the end of the day, the US intervention was purely for humanitarian reasons. There were no natural resources in Kosovo. As you may know, Kosovo does not produce or does not sit on oil reserves as some of the critics of US engagement in the Middle East would contend to be one of the 
sort of motivating uh, drivers behind US foreign policy engagements. Kosovo was not next door to China geographically or next door to Russia geographically. So there was no sort of geographical foothold that the US would necessarily gain uh, by engaging in this intervention uh, in Kosovo. And US was not a treaty ally of the United States. So uh, Washington was not legally bound or obligated in any way uh, or fashion uh, to, uh, uh, to intervene in uh, Kosovo. And then, uh, and this became particularly relevant after 9-11, uh, Kosovo is predominantly Muslim. Uh, most of the population in Kosovo are uh, uh, Muslim and not very practicing, but uh, still uh, uh, overwhelming majority of them are uh, Muslim. So this was not some sort of a, a religious crusade that uh, some would contend the U.S. was engaged in uh, when, it, uh, when it really helped uh, uh, Kosovo. So in my mind, it was simply a noble exercise of American power and uh, influence that, that I had witnessed, born out of, not of obligation or real politic, but out of desire to help a fellow uh, human uh, in need. Uh, so, so I would come into a class as an American uh, as a sort of an unabashed admirer of uh, U.S. role in the world uh, and uh, of the profound commitment by the U.S. to do good in the world and of the U.S. extraordinary ability to improve the lives of uh, countless people around the world, including in remote places that uh, only a few Americans had ever heard of or uh, potentially could not uh, uh, locate on a map. Uh, but above all, I would come into the class uh, in my subsequent professional experiences as someone who was profoundly grateful to the United States, uh, uh, who viewed the U.S. role in the world as is indispensable, uh, and who could not imagine living in the world in which norms and rules uh, uh, were not shaped by the idealism that went into the founding of this nation and the ideas that we try to live by uh, every day. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we still occasionally fall short as the general alluded in his uh, opening. Uh, but nevertheless, those ideas uh, I think were in display um, uh, in, in that intervention. Now I would note that more often than not, uh, that sense of admiration of the United States was a pleasant surprise uh, to uh, some of my classmates and professors. Uh, 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 here I was, if you will, a positive outcome of an American foreign policy uh, intervention. But sometimes I would also get asked uh, tough questions. Uh, uh, and sometimes some of my classmates would uh, bring up examples of US foreign policy initiatives that did not produce the intended results or had simply gone wrong. Uh, you, you know, people would raise the uh, Vietnam experience or people would raise uh, conflicts in Latin America uh, where US involvement had occasionally gone awry. And so, and then in turn, I would mention the World War II, I would mention the uh, Korea War, I would mention the Cold War, I would mention the uh, liberation of Kuwait as again, examples of US exercises of power in defense of, uh, of powerless. So we would have this sort of very spirited exchanges uh, with these two, two different uh, perfect, uh, perspectives. But over time, I would say, uh, I really came to appreciate this dialogue and the self-critical approach uh, that uh, I was witnessing among my classmates and, and, and the professors. Now, it took me some time to understand it, obviously, but uh, given my past experiences, uh, but, uh, but I really came to appreciate it. And this self-criticism that I was observing in the classroom and occasionally at the highest levels of the government when I had the privilege of serving there, uh, was actually a, a sign of confidence and, and competence, uh, uh, that this was not some sort of a self-doubt, uh, but rather it was a desire to, uh, to self-improve and do better uh, next time, as John McMaster said in his opening. And uh, so a country that's uh, open uh, to uh, introspection is a country that's strong, it's confident. And I think as John alluded to, we saw that in Alaska. And I think the National Security Advisor Sullivan reminded his Chinese counterparts that, that US is comfortable to, to take hard looks at itself sometimes because it recognizes that it's not, it's not perfect, that it can do better. And so, and, and, and so a country that's confident, it's, it's open to this level of introspection, a country that is motivated by helping a human being in need is self-critical when it cannot help every human being. Uh, and so, and so I would observe that sometimes. And a country that has come, uh, that has some of the best educated and smartest people 
uh, is rightly self-critical when the management of its policy initiatives don't go exactly as planned uh, uh, always. So over time, I, I really came to appreciate and understand that this self-criticism was born out of a desire to constantly improve and do better next time, to le learn mistakes past and never repeat them uh, in the future. Now, Occasionally, this self-evaluation can engender uncertainties, of course, and instill a degree of self-doubt. And it can occasionally lead to paralysis in the decision-making uh, in the government and excessive risk aversion. So one needs to be careful about not overcorrecting with this uh, introspection. And I think, you, you know, Syria, Ukraine, South China Sea are just some of the latest examples where perhaps a more confident approach on the part of the US and a more robust involvement could have potentially led to, to different outcomes. So a healthy degree of self-criticism, I would say, I would argue, is what really makes American foreign policy unique, and I would argue better in, in, in many ways. Uh, so I learned this invaluable lesson really at American University, and I carry with me uh, during my career in the US government, where I spent uh, 13 years. I had the privilege of uh, serving 13 years. Uh, so I often saw my role in, uh, in the government in the various policy debates that I would engage in as sort of fourfold, really, as, as an in-person reminder of successful uh, US foreign policy initiatives. Uh, so, so my colleagues could see that uh, the policy that they were working in could make a real impact, could improve the lives of others uh, uh, across continents, uh, and that it was possible. Uh, the second role was uh, sort of as a believer in the indispensable role of the United, that the United States plays in the world. If not the US, then who else uh, uh, was one of the uh, sort of the uh, questions we would always ponder. Then three, I would say as someone who, uh, whose admiration of, uh, of America was born out of power of ideas that America espouses and attempts to, uh, uh, to implement. And then lastly, uh, occasionally I will try to offer uh, some uh, or provide, I hope, uh, some, some useful ideas uh, and suggestions uh, on, uh, on policy. Uh, so as, as General Ambassador mentioned uh, at the beginning, I had the privilege of serving in various capacities in the US government. Uh, so I spent some time in Iraq. I worked on the Iran policy at the Pentagon and uh, at the White House. Uh, and then uh, I had the privilege of serving directly and helping uh, the Secretary of Defense, the 25th Secretary of Defense, Ash Carter. And then uh, and most recently had the privilege of uh, working for General McMaster at the White House as a Senior Director for Defense Policy and, and Strategy from 2017 to 2018. So few, if any places really around the world would provide such opportunities to a recent refugee and immigrant than the United States. And I will always uh, obviously be profoundly grateful uh, for these opportunities, especially to General McMaster. But I think it speaks to the broader theme of the, uh, of the discussion today, which is a, co a country that's confident in its values and in its ideals, is confident in welcoming and embracing uh, 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 those uh, who are recent arrivals and, and providing them with, uh, uh, with excellent opportunities and entrusting them uh, with, uh, uh, with such opportunities and uh, decisions on some of the most critical matters. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, for me, I, I will always be grateful that I had the opportunity to serve back uh, the United States, uh, the country that uh, in 99 had uh, rescued effectively my fellow Kosovars, my family and, and I, uh, and uh, obviously provided me with a home when I was uh, most in need. Um, and uh, you know, yeah, as I look back, of course, I'm grateful to American University and all my colleagues since then for teaching me really how to be both confident in the power of of one's ideas, but also open to, uh, uh, to probing, open to criticism, open to improving those ideas uh, so that you, uh, they are carried out with, uh, with success and for, uh, for good purpose. So with that, uh, uh, let me pause here and uh, uh, turn it back to uh, John McMaster. Uh, but uh, again, uh, I, I cannot be more excited to be uh, back at American. And again, John, it's a privilege to, to be part of this discussion with you and uh, uh, to have known you now for uh, uh, 14 years, uh, really. Uh, as I noted it before we started, my life was never the same since 2007 when you first uh, uh, were willing to bring me on board uh, in Iraq during the search. So thank you very much.
Hey, what great comments. Thank you so much. We have we have a number of questions already. And and you know, Tyler was was asking you based on you know your long experience in government and and really serving across across uh, three administrations, you know, and and seeing the you know the changes between administrations, but also the continuities as this new administration comes in, the Biden administration comes in, what do you see as as that administration's greatest challenge? And uh, then he had a related question of, of really how well do you think that team is prepared uh, to cope with those challenges? Because I know, for example, that you served uh, you know, alongside uh, Secretary Blinken or earlier in the Obama administration, as well as uh, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan. Um, so just your assessment, hey, what's, what are the challenges that they're, the greatest challenges that they're, that they're facing and, and just what's your impression of the team? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, great question, Tyler. Uh, uh, thank you, John McMaster. Uh, so I'll focus on the foreign policy aspect of it. So I won't touch on uh, what the challenges are uh, domestically, although uh, I would surmise to say that the priorities, probably the focus of the administration during the first year will be on uh, domestic uh, uh, issues, whether it's uh, COVID uh, uh, relief, uh, whether it's uh, some of the social and racial, uh, racial injustices that you mentioned, uh, John McMaster, at the beginning, uh, whether it's uh, infrastructure and energy and uh, and climate change. Uh, so, uh, so I would say uh, uh, during this year, we're probably more likely to see a heavier focus on, uh, on domestic policy than we would see on the uh, foreign policy front. Uh, when it comes to foreign policy and national security, I think in my sense is I think the primary challenge for this administration will be to institutionalize the transition uh, that uh, in priorities that uh, really you, John McMaster, started at the White House in 2017, 2018, which is the recognition that the US was uh, coming out of an era in which we had enjoyed uh, almost unrivaled uh, power and, 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 uh, and prestige and ability to, to project influence around the world. Uh, but that we have entered a new era in which uh, you have revisionist powers uh, that are attempting to either uh, uh, sort of undermine this uh, world order, uh, as is the case in Russia, or as in the case of, uh, of China, to uh, uh, gradually balance the US and eventually uh, uh, replace uh, the US as, a, uh, uh, as sort of the leading actor in, in, in the global stage. And so, uh, so that transition, I would say, started uh, uh, at least conceptually in 2017, 2018, with the national security strategy that, uh, that you wrote. Uh, at the White House and the National Defense Strategy that the Defense Department wrote. Uh, but it, now uh, the tough part comes, which is how do you institutionalize these changes? And for those uh, who have spent a lot of time in the government, especially at the Pentagon, uh, and Pentagon is a, it's a big institution uh, with a lot of entrenched uh, uh, old initiatives and uh, old thinking or traditional thinking and, and uh, uh, vested uh, sort of bureaucratic interests. And so getting people and getting the institution to think differently, prioritize differently, uh, uh, it, it takes a little bit of time. And so I would think, so I would say managing that transition is probably going to be the, uh, one of the toughest challenges <laughs> that this administration has uh, on its plate uh, as it uh, sort of begins with its uh, first 100 days uh, in office. Uh, but that being said, I think, uh, uh, you, uh, as you said, John McMaster, I know personally uh, uh, some of the senior uh, most officials in, in this government, whether at DOD or at the NSC or the State Department, uh, these are very experienced uh, 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 foreign policy hands, national security experts. Uh, th uh, this this is not their first rodeo in, in the government, and many of them have served previously under uh, past democratic administrations. So I think the expertise and the experience is, is there. Uh, so then the question just becomes uh, whether, uh, you know, we as a society and whether our broader political apparatus must, musters the political will, if you will, to successfully carry out uh, this transition. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm confident, uh, as I said in my, 
initial comments say, you know, I have sort of a, a undiminished belief in the U.S. and its ability to pull off the, the, the impossible. And I observed it, you know, in Iraq with you, General, when you rewrote the campaign plan for the surge. So, and so I'm confident by nature, and I'm, I'm a deep believer in the United States, but I think the elements are there that, that we could have a, a successful foreign policy transition over the next four years. Great, great, Ober. I, I would just add to, to, to an answer to Tyler's question is that I think just broadly, the greatest danger might be that <laughs> there is, I think, a tremendous desire to disengage from complex challenges abroad these days because of the introspection we do need, right? And, and emerging from the traumas of a pandemic, a recession, the, the social divisions laid bare by George Floyd's murder, and now the assault on the Capitol and the partisan vitriol <laughs> and so forth. You know, things are looking up, right? But I think there's going to be a tendency for us to, to want to be introspective. But the world's not going to stop for us, obviously, right? I think that uh, China's become more aggressive. I, I think if you want to really an example of the, you know, the maturity of the, of the Biden administration team and how confident uh, they are and, and uh, you know, in, 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 um, you know, in their ability to discharge their duties and, and, and fulfill the responsibilities of the American people, Look at the Alaska meeting uh, with uh, with the Chinese delegation, and I think uh, I think Secretary Blinken's words were extremely strong, uh, and indicate I think a very sound approach to 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 the competition with China. I think also what bodes well uh, are the are the, the those countries that joined in sanctions against uh, the Chinese Communist Party and, and entities um, associated with them for the genocidal campaign in Xinjiang as well, and. And, um, and so I, I think that there are some early, very positive indicators. What, what I'm probably concerned most about is this disengagement from sustained efforts against jihadist terrorist organizations in Afghanistan and more broadly across the Middle East. And I guess to, to paraphrase Trotsky, right, you know, or you know, he might not be interested in war, if the, the, the quote attributed in which he may or may not have said, but wars inter could be interested in you, right, as we learned on September 11th, or as the, the English theologian G.K. Chesterton said, you know, war is not the best way of settling differences, but it might be the only way to ensure they're not settled for you, right? And, and, um, and our, our enemies do have authorship over the future um, and don't have aspirations that go beyond, right, responses to what we do or decide not to do. You know, Ilber, uh, Amy had a, a question because she, it's, I think it's an interesting question given your experience in arriving here in 1999. How have you seen this partisanship develop? Are we are, are we more divided today than than you saw our country in 1999? What are your observations, maybe between today and 1999, but also across time as you served in in three different administrations? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah thank you, General, and uh, thank you, Amy. Uh, it's an excellent question, uh, and it's a hard one. Uh, I, I, I would say uh, to answer uh, because even though I've been here for about 22 years, uh, I'm still sort of fairly new, uh, particularly to the the, the domestic politics uh, of the U.S. And one always has to be humble not to necessarily jump to conclusions from Washington D.C. Uh, uh, yeah, I think. Uh, it is easy to uh, sort of develop a bubble uh, 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 of impressions uh, by being in DC. Uh, but then once you leave DC and you visit, you, you have the opportunity to visit elsewhere in the US, uh, the impressions you may get may be vastly different uh, than uh, uh, what you see uh, in, in DC. Uh, so, so, I, I, so I guess I would uh, limit a little bit uh, the, the, the time uh, of uh, my observations on this topic. Uh, so I got here in the last year of the Clinton administration. Uh, so, uh, you, you, you know, that uh, the other administration was just concluding its time in office. We went then through the experience in Florida, uh, which was uh, uh, somewhat as a surprise to me. Uh, I, I, I didn't have the, the right to vote back then because I was not an American citizen, but it was interesting to observe uh, uh, sort of the, the mini crisis we went through uh, with the hanging chads and, and, and the de uh, delay in the uh, results of the election. But at the same time, I would say I was very impressed that 
the institutions were very strong and robust. And, and now there might still be people who dispute the outcome uh, of, uh, of how things were settled in 2000, uh, but there was a process in place. It eventually went to the Supreme Court and, and the Supreme Court uh, uh, decided uh, and made a decision. And then uh, uh, former Vice President Gore accepted that outcome. Uh, so, uh, so for me as a new arrival from a place where political differences were settled uh, with machetes and, and machine guns uh, to observe uh, uh, to observe that experience was uh, was really uh, impressive in, in many ways that there was a political process and a legal process that was followed uh, and then the outcome eventually uh, was uh, was accepted even by the uh, by the losing side uh, so so I would say that was one of sort of the uh, the opening experiences it, it perhaps it exposed some polarization par partisan polarization uh, uh, but uh, but uh, we quickly, I think, uh, moved on from that. And then, uh, you know, President Bush was never sort of the legitimacy of his presidency, by and large, I would say, was not contested. And he went on to win re-election uh, four years later. Uh, so, uh, uh, so that was another reaffirmation, I think, that uh, uh, that some of the differences uh, uh, that were uh, uh, exhibited in in two thousand were uh, was sort of bridged. Uh, um, uh, 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 and then, uh, you, you know, we obviously had the first uh, African-American uh, president uh, in uh, President Barack Obama. Uh, so I think uh, uh, for me, uh, yeah, you know, again, as a new American by that point, uh, that was a really a powerful example that, uh, uh, that a nation that had uh, such a painful history uh, with, uh, with slavery, uh, including a, a civil war that almost uh, destroyed uh, the United States uh, uh, would end up uh, late as it is and may have been would end up electing uh, uh, an African American uh, as a president. So, uh, so that gave me sort of an additional uh, 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 kind of sign of uh, confidence and assurance that uh, at the end of the day, uh, the instincts of the American people uh, are right uh, that. Uh, that the institutions are robust, uh, that the democratic tra tra uh, uh, tradition is strong here, that uh, it can produce uh, encouraging outcomes and it can uh, withstand uh, challenges. You know, then we had the, uh, the Trump presidency, uh, obviously somewhat more controversial, I would say, than, uh, than past presidencies we've had, at least uh, in, in, in my memory. Uh, and, uh, uh, but even against all challenges that manifested itself during those four years, uh, I was still heartened by the resilience of, uh, of the institutions. Uh, the bureaucracy still managed to uh, uh, sort of uh, bring, uh, uh, bring some uh, um, uh, reasonableness, if you will, and a more commonsensical approach to certain policy initiatives. Uh, I would say the, the judicial branch uh, uh, performed fairly well uh, and uh, was able to, uh, uh, to, uh, preserve, uh, to sort of push back against some of the challenges. Uh, and then uh, uh, ultimately, uh, despite the sort of the unfortunate events we saw in the storming of the Capitol on January 6th, we still had a peaceful, uh, uh, and we still had a transition of power uh, on January 20th. We had a new president who won the election and who was sworn in. And so, so you see, I would say these uh, sort of fluctuations and uh, stress tests uh, through which our political system is, uh, goes through in, in our society. Uh, but uh, I guess, uh, you, you know, I'm maybe more glass half uh, full uh, I take a, 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 maybe a more a selective recollection of some of those in, in memories and in, in, in instances and remember the high points, which is, uh, you know, Al Gore's acceptance of the, uh, of the defeat in Florida, President Obama's election as the first African-American, and then uh, the, despite the, the, the storming of Congress is still uh, the validation of the electoral college votes and eventually the swearing in of, uh, of, uh, of President Biden. All this to say is that, of course, there's a lot of work uh, left, uh, uh, you know, particularly on these uh, social and uh, racial uh, uh, issues. And by far, uh, the American experiment is not uh, not over in that. We have a lot of work uh, uh, to do that. 
Uh, but I would say, uh, you, you know, the, the, the polarizations you see occasionally, uh, in part helped by, uh, by changes in, in the media environment uh, that we've seen, particularly the emergence of electronic media, social media, and the collapse of sort of the more traditional uh, media. Uh, so we see those spikes that are troublesome, uh, uh, but so far, I think, uh, either by fortune or uh, by uh, inherent strength, we have been able uh, to withstand there. So, uh, so I hope I come across as uh, more optimistic uh, uh, today than, uh, uh, than I think uh, some of the more recent experiences would have us uh, conclude. Hubert, hey, Je Jennifer asks, how do we sustain efforts uh, against jihadist terrorist organizations that threaten our country when the American people seem to no longer have the will to sustain those efforts abroad? Uh, yeah, uh, thank you, Jennifer. It's a, uh, it's a great question, and uh, I would say one that uh, we thought uh, uh, quite a bit to uh, struggle with uh, uh, in the last days of the Obama administration and the early years of the uh, Trump administration. And it's understandable, I think, that the, the duration of some of these conflicts and the, and the enormous financial and uh, uh, human sacrifices that have been made uh, 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 make it really difficult, if you will, to, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to continue to persist. Um, uh, but, uh, but that's what uh, uh, leadership is all about. It, it really takes uh, 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 effective leadership uh, at the very top, leveling with the American people, explaining what the consequences are, what, uh, first of all, what the US national interests are in being involved in, in, in those conflicts, what the consequences of inaction are, or the, what the consequences of withdrawal are, uh, and then uh, asking the American people uh, uh, for their support uh, uh, in uh, continuing uh, to, to advance US interests in, in, uh, there. I mean, and it, you, all you have to do is look at recent history. Uh, you, you know, we, uh, we effectively abandoned Afghanistan in uh, 1980. Uh, and uh, <coughs> sorry, we, we have, uh, in the 80s, and uh, uh, quickly Afghanistan descended in some of the most vicious cycles of, uh, of civil war, eventually leading to the emergence of Taliban, and then the incubator that they provided for Al Qaeda that attacked us here on 9-11. On uh, if you look at Iraq, uh, you, you know, we attempted the so-called uh, responsible drawdowns in the 2011 uh, time frame, and it took a year or so for ISIS to come back and, and, uh, and start plotting against our allies in Europe, actually conducting attacks against our allies in Europe, and then all inspiring attacks here, here in the US. So I think uh, 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 the leaders need to explain what uh, what's at stake here and uh, and uh, the importance of uh, you, you know making sure that we get to a sustainable outcome. I would say also the the mode of uh, uh, the methods through which we uh, we fight in these conflicts ha have evolved. Uh, you know, I, I don't think anyone is arguing anymore for going back and sending uh, the upwards of 100,000 troops in, in some of these theaters. So I think we've gotten smarter, we've gotten better. We have incredible military intelligence professionals and diplomats who have decades of experience now. So I think there, there might be a formula through which you can, uh, you, you can uh, scale your efforts uh, to such a way that it's supported by uh, the American public and it's sustainable until you get to an outcome that's, uh, uh, that's to, to our liking and, uh, and most importantly, to the liking of the local population, of course. Well, Brad, I just think that's a great answer. I do think public support it, it, you know, it can increase, right? If, with, with effective leadership and and really the, the two points that you're making, I think are immensely important that the American people deserve to know what is at stake and then what is a strategy that will deliver a favorable outcome at, at a cost that's acceptable to them. And I don't think, I don't think any of the last you know, three presidents, including the current president so far, have made, have made that case. And, and, uh, and I would just say for, for, you know, for uh, the students, I mean, looking at, uh, at Secretary Blinken's letter, the leaked letter to Ashraf Ghani, I think it, it reveals an astounding degree of self-delusion uh, in this idea that the Taliban is somehow you know, going to share power, uh, is, is reformed in some way and is less brutal, and that there's a, a bold line uh, between the Taliban and Al-Qaeda when those groups are completely intertwined. And that kind of self-delusion, I think, based on strategic narcissism, uh, leads to fundamentally unwise policies. And what you see in that letter is essentially the, the U.S. government partnering with the Taliban 
against the Afghan government, right? How can that be? Not only, it's not always that an unsound policy. I think it's a profoundly unethical one uh, as well. So, you know, I think that that uh, you know that that avoiding the cognitive traps uh, through strategic empathy and thinking clearly about the complex problems that we've emphasized in the seminar series, and then as you said, really communicating to the American people what is at stake because. You get the foreign policy, you get the wartime strategy that the American people are willing to support, right? It's a democracy. That's just the way it is. And and um, and so I I think it's a, it's a great question, Jennifer, and I think uh, you know, really helps us sum up quite a bit of what we've been discussing here. Hey, uh, there are lots of other questions here, but I think we've got we've only got six minutes, so I want to end with a, a couple of fun ones, uh, Gilbert. First of all, uh, what was your favorite AU memory? And, and then also, how did your time at AU impact and prepare you for your career? Yeah. That's uh, from Lisa, by the way. Uh, thank you uh, very much. So I, I would say uh, uh, probably some of my fondest memories from AU were the, the, the people I met. Uh, and I really, uh, to this day, my best friends are uh, people that I met at American University. Uh, and so, uh, uh, so I just treasure that, and, and will always have that. And if it wasn't for American, I, I don't think that would have happened. One thing, you know, you know when I, I had settled in D.C., so I was looking at, at different schools here, and I'm just very, uh, uh, very grateful that I ended up going to American because it, it was the environment, uh, it was the perfect environment of learning, uh, but also camaraderie. And yeah, I think some of the nicest people's. Uh, and people were uh, were American, uh, not to uh, you know disparage the other schools, but uh, but really it was just uh, 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 you know uh, some of the uh, the best people uh, I, I met. So uh, so I would say uh, to to the first question, to the second question, I would say American really prepared me uh, in in many ways. I think. Um, I, honestly, I learned how to write at American. I mean, I knew how to write a, a sort of a basic level of English, a, a, but American helped me how to write professionally. A, a, so I really honed that skill a, 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 at American. And then it, it really helped me in every job that, a, that, a, that, I, a, 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 that I had after that. A, you know, doing well at American it helped me then get into a graduate school, graduate program, and get a scholarship. So that allowed me, uh, if you will, to pursue my uh, my master's. And then, uh, you know, Washington it tends to be a small place. So uh, over the years, you run, uh, you come across American alumni, and so uh, you help one another. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, yeah, uh, so uh, that was also uh, uh, very tremendously helpful uh, uh, from America. So, uh, so I really, uh, uh, I loved it there, and uh, I, I wish I could come back uh, more frequently. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, yeah, I'm eager to uh, bring our son back. Uh, we have a three and a five year, uh, three and a half year old, and uh, so I'm eager to bring him back on campus and, and maybe get him a little eagle uh, uh, shirt and, and hat. All right, we only have a couple a couple minutes left. Uh, one other question uh, from from uh, Lisa was that what's what have you found as a difference now that you've entered into the to the private sector? I think it's a great question because yeah. so many of the competitions with which we're engaged, you know, cut across public and and private sector. So many of the opportunities. Uh, so, yeah. what are, what are, what are your impressions of your your new career here? Yeah. So. Uh... And so I made the transition in 2019. So about 13 years after, uh, uh, so 13 years after uh, uh, the U.S. government. So I spent the first 13 in the government, and I've been uh, uh, with Goldman for a year and a half now. Um, uh, uh, I would say, uh, you, you know, different uh, two worlds have their own uh, strengths and weaknesses, uh, if you will. Uh, uh, you, you know, I've been impressed, if you will, with. Uh, uh, with uh, the uh, degree of efficiency, with the uh, degree of uh, thirst for information uh, that you see in the private sector, the competitiveness of it, uh, uh, meaning that uh, not necessarily within your work environment, but uh, uh, from your other competitors, the need to always uh, stay the best, be the best, uh, 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 because otherwise the competition will, uh, will fill the void. 
so uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. so I'm still learning to be frank uh, 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 this new world and this new role that uh, that I've embraced but so far I've enjoyed it I'm working with some of the smartest people I've ever met uh, uh, who don't have the same background but have a unique ability to grasp the issues that uh, that I have experience in and I continue to focus on so I focus on geopolitical uh, environments there at the same time, in the government, if you will, you have tremendous professional and tremendous expertise and people who come in day in and day out and <laughs> accept either the criticism in the media sometimes or by different political parties who are underpaid but continue and do their job with the best way they can. Uh, and but they are part of a team that's uh, making a difference. Uh, particularly, I mean, I think it's unique to be part of a government in the U.S. Uh, because uh, you know, you're in a position to shape worldwide events. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, so the opportunity to serve, uh, the opportunity to make uh, the world a better place, uh, the opportunity to advance American foreign policy, uh, those are uh, uh, those are just exceptional uh, uh, things. Uh, uh, that I had the privilege of, uh, of doing. So that's so I would say, depending on where you are in your professional life, uh, one may be a better fit uh, the, than the other. Uh, and, 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 and you can go back and forth. Uh, so uh, I thought the time had come for me to learn something new. Uh, so I wanted to go into the financial services and learn something else. And then perhaps at some point, uh, go back in the government. Uh, uh, hopefully when Joe McMaster goes back at some point. <laughs> Not to put you on the spot. <laughs> you know, Bear, I, can't, I can't thank you enough. I can't think of a better role model for American University uh, students than, than you. Thank you for joining me. Thanks to all of you for attending today. Thanks especially to David Bostoff and Lindsay, Lindsay uh, Schwalson, uh, and especially the great Professor Amy Dacey for the great opportunity to be part of this, uh, this wonderful program at the Sign Institute. Gilbert, thanks so much. As always, a pleasure to see you. And, and uh, I look forward to catching up here uh, soon in the po our post-pandemic world. Thank yes, you so yes. much. Yeah, likewise. The pleasure was all mine. Thank you so much, John. Thanks. Thanks, Gilbert. Take care. Take care, everybody. Stay well. <laughs>